much. Are these mics on? Yeah, I suppose they are. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, the question that we've been uh, asked to address is, um, is polyamory uh, an answer to our promiscuous instincts? Um, the questions that follow, of course, are, uh, is it a good answer? Is it a viable answer? Um, the ambit of the trop topic is rather broad. It's uh, rather deep. And the many different lens that you can examine it through, historical, traditional, cultural, moral, uh, psychological. And uh, the 45 odd minutes that we've been given is hardly enough to begin skimming the surface of it. But we're going to try and get into it and uh, see what we come out with. Uh, we have some excellent panelists, and uh, most of all, it's unfair. They've all done, uh, their body of work is incredible, and it's uh, unfair to give them as little uh, time as we do have, uh, but uh, we should get on with it without further ado. Okay, so starting with the question itself, um, we're talking about polyamory being an instinct, and I think the first question I'd like to ask the panelists is, whether they do think that polyamory is our natural instinct and uh, monogamy is uh, at worst an imposition and at best cultural conditioning. Um, Fats of the house. Did you say polyandry? Polyamory. Polyamory. Man is a promiscuous creature and uh, marriage is an invention of patriarchy. Women are sharers, men are possessors. Women never were exclusive. Women invented agriculture. Women invented the first culture. Women are mothers, but the stupid patriarchy has destroyed even women. The modern woman is an ugly creature. I'm sorry to say. And patriarchy has made this creature called the modern woman, who is jealous, destructive, possessive, and man is equally guilty. And when we learn to share, all our troubles will end. And I'm hoping that polyamory will move us closer to sharing uh, men and women alike. Uh, people ask this question all the time, is, is polyamory natural? Is it instinctual, whatever, right? Or is it an artifact of culture? And I don't think it's possible to really sort those things out. I think that, and I think it doesn't matter, because what I do know is that since I've been teaching about this stuff since 1973, what I know is that people who choose to do something different from what they have learned from their culture can learn what they need to know to do something different and take on something new. Is it the answer? No. Is it an answer? No. It's a thousand answers. It's a million answers. Because the idea of polyamory is can we all be free to establish our relationships, our sexuality, our love, our intimacies, in whatever way fits for us at whatever time in our life we're looking at. Um, Mr. Merchant, first I would like to say, you yes, just described. Is this working? Get if you could just working. speak up a little bit. Yeah. Um, you just described Donald Trump, not a woman. In your description of what men have done to women, what men have turned women into, was a perfect description of Donald Trump. So it's not just women. And yeah, yeah, I hold the patriarchy guilty. I'm a product of the patriarchy. I'm the patriarchy gone wild. And, and how, how do you describe this patriarchy in your, what's your well, definition? Well, you said Donald Trump. One word is enough. It's the triumph of Trumpism. And he's responsible for turning women into? Fiends, fiends, into fiends. So they have no integrity within their own being. Men can turn women into? When men turn themselves into women, the world will be better off. 
<laughs> Would you like to quickly um, answer the question about uh, monogamy? <laughs> Sorry, a little sidetrack. That's, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> well, uh, what patriarchy is and what it does is uh, another panel for another time. But right. uh, perhaps quickly, uh, the instinct of polyamory versus the construct of monogamy. Where do you stand? I think there is an instinct to connect. There's an instinct to connect platonically. There's an instinct to connect romantically. It begins in infancy. It never leaves us. How, as adults, we take that instinct depends on both experience, upbringing, desires. What direction our desires take us in? I would be very interested to know how many of the audience think that we, are, we have a promiscuous instinct. Well, hopefully we'll be able to get the audience in eventually. But uh, staying with the conversation for a minute, Hoshang um, said that, uh, you know, he, one of the things he pointed out is that uh, the construct of monogamy owes, itself, uh, owes its beginnings and probably in patriarchy. Um, any other thoughts on where, you know, if polyamory is indeed the basic instinct, uh, where did, how and where did the construct of monogamy develop? Uh, patriarchy, of course, it has its roots in patriarchy. I think uh, a lot of us might agree with that. But um, to go further than that, uh, what parts of the world, uh, 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 you know, where, where did it start to surface first historically, and what part might religion have played in, um, in the creation of monogamy as a, a, a sort of staple uh, way of uh, men and women cohabiting. Yeah, I, can I speak to that? Of course. There's a marvelous book out there. I don't know if you've had Chris Ryan and Casilda Hitha here at the festival, but you should, you should, you want them, called Sex at Dawn, which I heartily recommend. Their thesis is Sex at Dawn. Their thesis is that when we discovered agriculture, the private ownership of land and of women, the means of production, became important to people. And people started having wars and fighting over the ownership of land and women. And so controlling women's sexuality became an issue in that thing. And he, they look at cultures all over the world that haven't found that necessary and also um, but it's, it's an interesting way of looking at it, I think. It it's kind of makes sense that there is a motive to say, if I'm going to have a dynasty, I've got to keep them women from, you know, fucking around so that they don't have children that aren't mine. Primitive, but effective. I, I, we come from centuries of romantic love, starting certainly in the 12th century with the, troupad <coughs> with the troubadours, um, and unrequited love, and that gave voice to this ideal of love for the perfect object. Perfect love, perfect object. And it became very much part of Western civilization, and it's taken various permutations, but in many ways, it has served us well in that and as long as we understand this is an ideal, not that there is anybody who's perfect, but there is such a thing as perfect love. And that can be directed at someone who, who meets your ideal of, of goodness, at, if you're speaking as a 12th century troubadour, goodness, beauty, um, spirituality. It was very connected to spirituality. And probably before the troubadours, they probably came from the Carthans who used this kind of singing and poetry to connect with the divine. So the troubadours then take the, make the lady in the castle the divine. Some of those uh, traditions exist here as well, at least in Sufi poetry. But before we carry on, Hoshang, would you like to? Yeah, you see, uh, adultery is the theme of literature. Uh, we don't have to go to the troubadours. We have to go back to Homer 
you know, Helen of Troy being shared by Paris and, uh, uh, you know, this whole war, the whole Trojan War is about adultery. Uh, Madame Bovary is about adultery. Anna Karenina is about adultery. What is adultery? It's one, uh, one woman shared by two men. That is adultery. Now, I have my own take on the troubadours, you know. You have spiritual love when you can't have sex. This lady that they were hymning was Eleanor of Equitin. She was an old pickled prune. And the men who were writing this lovely poetry to her were gay men like Ho Shang Merchant, okay? So love is not heterosexual, love is homosexual. Love in the Western world was invented by the homosexuals. The heterosexuals have taken it over and now they are throwing it in the face of the homosexuals without any relation to history. Okay, um, that does deserve an applause, so if you'd like to. <laughs> Okay, uh, morality and uh, uh, you know the, the the history of the construct aside, um, it's possible to argue that uh, psychologically, uh, the idea of multiple partners, the idea of open relationships, is um, for better or worse, not something that we're always equipped to deal with. Uh, it tends to be a sort of Pandora's box. And uh, your book, Dossie, The Ethical Slut, um, it, it's, it sort of lays out a kind of roadmap for dealing with it. And, 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 and a lot of your life's practice and work has been around this as well. Uh, now, if people want a, a complete lowdown on this, they'll have to buy The Ethical Slut and, and read it. But I'd like Dossie to give us a, a little bit of an insight um, into uh, how she has found uh, that we can cope with our desires. Okay, I mean, in terms of, um, there, are, there are other reasons why people might not want to be polyamorous, but certainly fear of jealousy is one of them. Uh, fear that they will have an overwhelmingly unpleasant experience that knocks them, you know, just blows them out of the water uh, that is unbearable. And I think that we have to look to what social contracts, constructs and beliefs we have about jealousy. We teach small children to share their toys. We teach small children to deal with their anger, to build containers for anger and sadness and hurt and upset. But we don't teach anyone to deal with jealousy of this type, of sexual jealousy of, uh, I mean, we do a little bit in sibling rivalry and it's not a bad model. Uh, but the truth is that we can learn to cope. We can change our responses. Uh, some of that has to do with the fact that when we take care of ourselves in a kindly manner, when we, if the simplest thing that you can do if you have an overwhelming emotion, and this is true of certainly of jealousy, is jealousy tends to be projected, right? You're there going, These, you did this to me and you did that to me and you shouldn't have done this and you shouldn't have done that and I'm feeling terrible because you did something bad. Well, that is projection. That's running your movie on someone else. If we can move into saying, wow, that's really sad that I feel so bad and I'm having such a hard time when two people I love are connecting. I don't want to be the person who's having a hard time in this. So what can I do? Well, what I can do, and this is actually supported by modern neuroscience, believe it or not, I can tell you about the MR, functional MRI research. Um, I love modern neuroscience. It proves so many good things that we knew all along. Um, what we can do is we can go and just say, OK, this is my feeling. I want to learn how to build containers for it. I want to learn how to receive myself with understanding, without judgment, gently, kindly. And every time we do that, every time we find a way to soothe ourselves and take care of ourselves, when we feel any negative feeling, but particularly jealousy, well, I can tell you that glial cells grow fibers into the amygdalas that deliver gabapentin, but that won't make sense to most of you. But the truth is that every time we succeed in soothing ourselves, it changes our brain. We actually grow more capacity to do it the next time. So if you make a practice of being nice to yourself when you feel terrible, after a while you will find it easier and easier and easier to Listen to yourself, be kind to yourself, and just move out, move through that experience successfully and come to a place of calm 
that hopefully includes self-esteem and self-acceptance. Would you? I have to say something. <laughs> sure. You see, she is a practicing psycho, yes. psychological counselor, you know, and she's coming from that side. And I have lived in many cultures, and I and my sister, who was a good Parsi girl from Bandra, we went when we were 20 years old to America, and my sister, she died recently. She, she was a large-hearted person like my mother. You know, women are large-hearted creatures. They have no trouble loving everybody. You know, that's not the point. But does the culture allow you to do it? My sister was not culturally American. She was culturally Indian. And there she was being torn apart by this mad sexuality of America, you know, where she was trying to keep two men in her life happy. She had anorexia uh, nervosa. She had oh, emphysema. And, she suffered for 14 years, bedridden. She made a million for the men in her life. She left it to the men in her life, and she died. I mean, what kind of a life is that? I mean, what is our culture doing to sensitive people? I mean, Indian culture is different from American culture. You know, I might want to do something, but my, I'm a man. I may be gay, but I'm a man. I can fight. My sister was a woman. And she belonged to my generation. She's not this teeny buffer generation who becomes a journalist and blah, 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 blah. You know, that, that's, that's not the, uh, the, the culture we come from, you know? And we have to understand that jealousy can be overcome by kindness and love and sagacity, personal sagacity, but culture is obdurate. Culture is enforced by people who have no minds. Absolutely. I, I think uh, jealousy is just one. I mean, we have to take Hoshang's point on board. Jealousy is just one of the things that complicates a uh, life of polyamory. Um, culture is, is a whole different thing. And hopefully, we'll get some time towards the end to talk about that in some detail. Um, but. I wanted to take the conversation forward, talking about just jealousy and different aspects of jealousy. Jealousy, again, isn't a monolith. Uh, jealousy comes in many forms. It comes as insecurity. It comes as pure possessiveness, of course, but it also comes in the form of insecurities. Um, just being the, uh, just feeling rejected can also sometimes, um, like I said, open a Pandora's box of other negative feelings that we tend to have about ourselves. We live in a world where we are constantly made to feel anxious about ourselves for something on some count or the other. Um, there are insecurities galore uh, that we face in, in, in different cultures for different reasons. But I think uh, you'd agree that the, the, the common thread of insecurity and anxieties uh, runs through um, uh, modern life. And um, uh, one could argue that uh, this sort of vulner the kind of vulnerability that comes with putting yourself out there, loving more than one person, um, and exposing yourself to uh, a rejection of, of, of some sort that you could eventually feel could also tap into those negative feelings and they could just spiral. And uh, in a culture like India, for example, you're a therapist and, it's, and you're, a, you're a counselor and uh, it's very common in Western cultures to go to therapy and to, to uh, get help when, um, you know, when things spiral. Uh, in our heads, but in India, for example, it's still a bit of a taboo to go and see um, a counselor or a therapist in, in large parts. Um, so I was wondering if, if uh, there's something you'd like to add about that, and uh, also jealousy itself. I mean, being the sort of counter-intuitive um, instinct to, uh, uh, to polyamory, and uh, is, it, is it a fight that's worth it? We know it can be fought, but is it a fight that's worth it? Either of you. Uh, in your book, you state that everybody wants to be loved, a, mm -hmm. a given. Absolutely. And I think at the heart of jealousy is the terrible fear that you won't be, and nothing good ever comes from fear. So in order to overcome jealousy, we would have to address the fear of not being loved, and that is a tall order. 
That is a really tall order. And <clears throat> jealousy is so passionate. I, I love the mythical story of Hera coming down from Mount Olympus and turning one of Zeus's girlfriends into a cow. She did terrible things to Zeus's other women. It was powerful, powerful external personification of how, how we feel. I think all of us would agree that jealousy is a very negative emotion. No good ever came of it. Um, people have been killed over it. Many people actually have been killed over it. Um, and in, in Buddhism, it's one of the ways that you accumulate really bad karma. It's one of the most harmful emotions. Given that, given knowing all that, some emotions are just really, really hard to come to terms with. You can understand them, you understand their reasons, you can come to terms, but you still feel as if you've been kicked in the gut if somebody has done, I'm, I'm only thinking of love relationships, not being jealous of somebody because she has beautiful bl long black hair. But in a love relationship, if your love object loves somebody else, I'm fascinated, and, and I think you even call it spiritual work, correct, in your book? Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So how have you... May I ask you that question? How have you successfully taken patients through the steps? It's, it's so much more complicated than putting it in a box. It will just keep jumping out of the box. So how have you done it successfully? Well, it's different for different individuals because you have to look at what gets in the way, right, and what their jealousy is. If I were to ask around the room how each of you experienced jealousy, we would get 100 different answers because it's not the same thing. Um, my original impetus was I refused to give jealousy that kind of power. I do not empower jealousy. I don't believe in it. I don't um, allow it. I decided a long time ago that I would never do anything I was ashamed of because I was jealous. Uh, it's not like I never experience it, but I take care of it, take care of it, take care of it. And over and over again, that has been so rewarding to me that learning to take care of myself when I was in terrible pain was obviously a great thing to learn how to do. I mean, it, it gives me all kinds of benefits. So I decided that I wanted to live in a world without jealousy or with jealousy that each person owned and managed by themselves without inflicting it on the entire, all, their whole world. And that I was determined not to let it stop me from loving who I love and loving the way that I love. And was that there were many, many ways to learn. So yes, right, therapy is very individual. The, the principles I'm putting out in the book and speaking now are some useful principles that many people have found useful. Does that answer your question? I have a little mantra that I want to give to the jealous ladies in this room. You know, my teacher Anas Neen used to say, she can't give him what I alone can. So make yourself powerful. Um. I wanted to ask you, Barbara, uh, you spoke in the beginning, we didn't get uh, the chance to follow that thread. But when we were talking about the roots of monogamy, you mentioned uh, the construct of romantic love, uh, the idea of perfect love for a perfect object, the ideal, rather, of a perfect love for a perfect object. Um, now, the way I look at romantic love, the idea of falling in love with a perfect person, um, it's, it requires some sort of myth building, the idea of falling in love, the idea of investing yourself uh, in, in romance um, and uh, sort of all the accessories and paraphernalia of romance. And um, is, is fidelity the bedrock 
of that sort of myth construction, would you say? And therefore, um, sort of opposed to the instinct of polyamory. Such a good question. Um, I didn't fully answer it earlier. Not sure I will now. Uh, myths, myths are created to explain something we cannot put into words. And so the myth of romantic love is a way of trying to articulate, act out something that is beyond words. The connection between two people, when two people are lucky enough to fall in love and who decide that marriage is a good thing for them, for these two people, for many reasons. What I find admirable about the institution, and absolutely it is rife with struggles, power struggles, and suppression of freedom, but so is life. Life, you go out of here and you're going to find those, those problems. The pr difference in marriage is that you might feel trapped. If, if you're weak, you might feel trapped. So putting that aside, I'm going to talk about the ideal marriage. In the ideal marriage, in the Christian world, the idea is that the two of you, your job through life, is to help each other become what God meant you to become. Now, I don't use the word God. I do believe that it's a wonderful opportunity to help somebody you admire and love become the best person they can become. And it's a wonderful laboratory for developing the strongest possible emotions, even stronger than jealousy, and I think the most admirable, compassion, kindness, and loving kindness. And these are, and wisdom, resulting wisdom, and generosity, and these are characteristics which we are called on in marriage, in relationship, to act on every single day, and it's very hard. It's very easy to go out into the world and do compassionate, kind work. It is very hard to do so when your husband has just burped at the dinner table, <laughs> um, or has said something terrible to hurt your feelings or make, make you jealous. But the work the work is for such a good cause, and it's intense, and I think it works because there's a great trust between two people who, knowing each other very well and being the guardians of each other, are allowing themselves to be vulnerable. A trust is, is built, and I wonder, and I don't know, I mean, there are no scientific studies about percentage of people happier one way or the other. So I don't know whether it's possible to have time. If you have many lovers, do you have the time to do all that? Well, in a way, the values that you're talking about are what I would like to see as the values of the world. And to create a polyamorous family or a constellation or a community, you have to do a lot of work on the culture because you have to create what is a safe place to have that kind of vulnerability, to be able to open it up to everybody that you love or however much, however is appropriate in whatever situation, but to have that safety. One of the first courses I took on, on relationships said something amazing. The teacher said, intimacy is based on shared vulnerability. Nothing makes it, brings us closer together than when we're struggling with the hard stuff. 
And I think that is beautiful. Scary, but beautiful. And thank you. <laughs> uh, so to make a safe space, I mean, it's, it's actually it becomes a political act. How do I build a place where we can have a community where we don't have to have this tiny little boundary around wh what can be loving and open and, and faithful? I mean, my definition of fidelity is that I commit to treat my lovers well, with compassion, with open-heartedness, uh, with um, honesty, with integrity. That's my definition of faithful. Not that I don't have sex, who I have sex with or who I don't have sex with. Um, and so to create those communities, yeah, and it's, it is sort of a political act because when we create a community in which it's safe to love, for people to share love on that level and with that depth, then we are creating something very, very different from what our governments are creating. I want to say that values depend on cultures, and cultures change and values change. It's all very well to convert this room into a church and talk about Christianity, but there was a pre-Christian world, if you know your history, before Christianity, and when Christianity came in, St. Paul allowed even the bishops to marry homosexual lovers because it came from Rome, which was a homosexual culture. So what are we talking about? If we are talking about polyamory, you also have to talk about uh, uh, bisexuality. Why are you just talking about men and women? Why don't you talk about men and women and men? I mean, uh, it's very well. I mean, just as uh, Darcy said, uh, our governments are different. They are uh, bombing the children in Iraq before they are born, and you talk about Christian values? Hoshang, I had another question for you. Um, earlier you mentioned, uh, you, read, you raised a very interesting point about literature when she was talking about troubadours. Uh, you mentioned Homer, you mentioned Anna Karenina, and you mentioned, uh, I think, Madame Bovary, and adultery being the central premise of these uh, um, literary Are, Baba, there is, uh, uh, in the Ramayana, have you, the first book that was banned by Nehru was Aubrey Menon's Ramayana. It is available on the internet. Go and read it. You don't have to go far to find adultery. It's in your own house. It's in your own heart. Of course it is, but what literature? you also mentioned Anaya Nin, and you mentioned, you, I, I believe you wrote on Anaya Nin, and you called her your uh, guru. Uh, could you talk a little bit about maybe literary cultures or uh, movements um, that opposed uh, this Look, sort of hegemony? Look, the homosexuals are the only one who are talking about love now, okay? It started with Helen doing her sleazy dances at Mehbu Studios. Now it has gone to Kangana, Ranavat, and now uh, that Johar creature is going to come very soon here. You know? Horrible, horrible. You know, the, the homosexuals are only the only one who are keeping the flame of love alive today. Okay, then taking on from that, uh, Darcy, perhaps uh, you'd like to take this one. Um, Polyamory is often, uh, for better or worse, um, associated more with uh, gay dating cultures and perhaps lesbian dating cultures as well. Um, is, could there be some truth to it? Where does this notion come from? And uh, the different cultures, again, that, that allow uh, uh, marriages to exist, the institution of marriage to exist between same-sex partners, and in India, of course, it's, not, uh, uh, it's unthinkable at this point in time. Um, does that play a part in uh, the idea of polyamory being more associated with gay and lesbian dating cultures as well? Well, living gay or lesbian or queer of any sort is already taking a step outside of the mainstream culture against sometimes really incredible opposition. I know people who are threatened with execution in Nigeria for being queer. I mean, it's, it's terrifying sometimes how heavy that gets. But so gay and lesbian people, we are a people who have already questioned society's values. We are people who have already stepped outside of the mainstream. So we become kind of a natural group of people to try on some new ideas. We already have a lot of experience with it. In order to survive, we had to learn how to survive outside the mainstream culture and how to think and to create 
what the mainstream culture told us could not be love, could not be intimate, could not be vulnerable, could not be safe. And so I think that the reason that it started with us in many ways, although this is, you know, most of the, the, the mostly heterosexual poly groups I know of actually have a large amount of bisexuality in them. So they are really more pansexual. Um, so you break one rule, it's easy to break some more rules. You know, you might as well question the rules and keep going on and decide what you want your own rules to be, I say. Does that answer your question? It does. But uh, would you like to say something? Okay. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's interesting that we, uh, uh, perhaps these two worlds uh, that both of you are talking about, these, these two universes of polyamory versus monogamy, have much more in common than, um, than we are acknowledging, mm -hmm. in the sense that jealousy is something that needs to be dealt with in both uh, setups, as does the question of what constitutes fidelity over time. Um, but more than that, there's this idea of rule making and rule breaking, right? Um, when Barbara was talking about uh, the idea, the institution of marriage, and at its core, it can be a beautiful idea, but uh, when you add on the layers that somehow seem to have accumulated over the years uh, in terms of how religion has imposed a certain uh, sense of, uh, uh, you know, a, a certain form of patriarchy and, and, and the way in which this institution has also been used to exploit um, gender, to keep certain, uh, certain forms of love outside the purview of what is acceptable and mainstream. Um, it occurs to me that even when it comes to monogamous romantic love, um, a lot of rules need to be broken, a lot of layers need to be stripped away to get to the core of what is beautiful, right? Um, I was wondering if that's something that you'd like to talk about um, in. Uh, in the States, it's very, it's accepted and very apparent that the strong person in a, in a marriage is the woman. And the best place to see that is if you go down south, the southern women who come from a long line of women who ran plantations while their husbands were in the Civil War, these women learned what they could do. They became familiar with their power they know they're the bosses, and yet, to make it acceptable to their husbands, they will do, put on the Southern Bell Act to make their husbands happy, and it doesn't, it doesn't make them feel compromised at all because they know their own strength. Um, so, the breaking of rules, I don't, I don't like the word rules. I, I like more to think of how, how we live a life that serves our highest ideals. And those, those aren't rules. Every day I wake up, this is the ideal. If everybody in the world woke up every day and said, I am going to begin this day with compassion and everything that comes from my heart, my lips, body, speech, mind is going to come from a place of compassion. That's not a rule, but it's very, very powerful. Um, it's not even a directive. It's just that where it where people have been able to do it, the enlightened beings who've been able to do that, are very, very, very happy people, far happier than anything we see in general, whether polyamory or monogamy. You're living a, a life that is beyond all these considerations and is serving a higher ideal. And that can be in any of these relationships, but it's for something bigger. The, the partnerships are, are 
the world in miniature, like those beautiful paintings, the beautiful, beautiful Indian miniature paintings. What we do in the privacy of our bedrooms, over our dining room tables, raising our children, being friends, all of that is what we hope the world can be like. And that doesn't have anything to do with rules. Pragya, I've been asked to remind you about the time. Uh, sure, is this, how much time do we have left? Do we have? It is Sorry? 10 past. How, how much time do we have? 10 minutes? Okay, uh, I'm gonna I ask. I want to say something. Sure. I want to ask these Christian theologists and Christian uh, psychologists what they have achieved in this world first. And uh, you're all talking about perfect love and perfect this and romantic this and romantic that. Where does it exist? If you don't know where it exists, let me tell you, it exists on Earth. And Earth is an imperfect place. And we are all imperfect. And we don't uh, expect perfection in anything. Why do you ask love and marriage to be perfect? How can love be perfect in an imperfect world? Why don't you accept your imperfections? As my teacher used to say, my uh, Navy man teacher, he used to find the international fudge factor and be happy. Just fudge along. <laughs> don't, put, don't put weight on yourself and on the other person in the relationship like this. This is nonsense. You're living in cloud cuckoo land. Um, uh, that's most certainly true, and I wish we had more time, because one of the things that we couldn't, we didn't get the time to address, is uh, in an imperfect world, when we talk about polyamory, we are also talking about uh, bigamy, we're also talking about uh, polygamy. And uh, in an imperfect world, where gender relations are imperfect, it tends to be skewed against the rights of women. And uh, I, I hope there will be another panel in which we can address this. Uh, but in the meanwhile, we have about five or ten minutes, I think. And uh, if there are any questions in the audience, um, then uh, we'd be happy to take them. Is there a mic anywhere? Uh, we have, we're very short on time, so one uh, small request. Keep your questions on point and uh, make sure they're questions and not comments. Hopefully, uh, the speakers will be around later to take your comments and questions. Uh, Ma'am, on your very left here. Uh, sure. Yeah. It's, it's my pleasure to uh, listen to you. What a wonderful topic this is. Let me tell you one thing that uh, correct this uh, correct sir here. If the, uh, what will be the society be if I if I just give you permission to fudge around to keep on uh, belittling my faith in you? If you as a lover, I have faith in you. I ask you, what is the society of tomorrow? That why do you feel that the earth is imperfect? Why can't relations be perfect when you are seeking perfect, when God has made you perfect? What will be the society be if I keep on uh, betraying my girlfriend or a wife or a woman? If I say nasty things early in the morning or every time I hurt her? What will be the society be if I have sex with many, many I fall into different relationships? Forget about okay, sex. Okay, so I think, we, I think we get your question. It seems more like a rhetorical question, but if any of you want to take that, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to pass the mic to you. Though it does um, seem more like a comment than a question to me. I, if, if I take the point of view myself, and I do a lot of, of, of thinking about this in terms of a spiritual understanding, that we are here, we are clearly not perfect, I don't believe that God put us here in order to become perfect. What I believe is that our imperfections are part of our reality and part of our divinity. I don't believe there's anything wrong with us that needs to be excised. I think that we are indeed the people doing what we're doing. If we didn't have any struggles or anything we had to work with, we would become really shallow people, frankly. If I may make a rather pithy um, comparison. I discovered long ago when I was young that tall, good-looking men with large penises who could screw for a long time never learned the arts of love. Oh, well. Um, yes, please. To Miss uh, Easton, yeah? the effort to control means of production, you said, has culminated into monogamy. And uh, Polyandry will reverse the situation, you think? Will the women be empowered? One. 
In the Indian situation, the division of labor has culminated into caste. So polyandry will have some bearings on the caste system here in India. Number two, Mr. Hoshang, one question, because he is always referring to culture. And uh, do you think uh, caste system is also our culture that we have to venerate and uh, be, uh, you know, we have to be bound by it? Three. And last, the jealousy about jealousy you are talking about, because polyandry is not, you know, it coexists with polygamy. It is not, it, it also because when women are polyandric, men also can practice the same polygamy. So I don't think the situation of jealousy will exist in that condition. I'm talking about a very distant situation. And last but the, not the least, we have goals. Relationship is one such goal. But this should decide the entire society, do you think, because we have many other goals. Why should we just the whole lot of time we spend to just maintain relationships? Well, maybe because relationships are kind of important to us. But I think that, I think that we are at a time historically and um, in terms of actually the technology of our culture and the wealth of, uh, uh, especially of those of us who are middle class and, and benefited from a lot of education and a lot of access to the culture. This is not true of everyone on the world, in the world. Uh, if we took an average standard of living, we would be looking at something very different from the, the group of people who are here at this conference. But we are looking at very unprecedented freedom in life that we didn't have before. Freedom from, we don't expect to starve. We expect that even if we had a downturn in our income, we would still do okay. We would manage, right? We're not so fragile. So I'm looking at what kind of cultures are we building now? How do we take the traditions forward and move them into this sort of brave new world? And I feel very privileged to be part of this. We do a lot of things wrong. We try things. Some of them don't work out. Maybe somebody else could make them work better. I don't know. But I'm very excited to be in a place where some of these scripts are being written. So to me, I take a kind of brave new world kind of stance to say, yes, these are very imperfect answers, but we are struggling. We're part of the struggle. We're trying to see what it's like to move into the future, a future where perhaps most people will have a number of relationships in their lifetime, and those relationships will be precious and will be valuable and will be loving. That's what I see. Excuse Any me. thoughts? Excuse me. Excuse uh, me. Um, hello. Excuse me. I I'm just here. want to say uh, it was a privilege listening to the two ladies. I'm grateful to you, and what you spoke was the truth, and it was beauty, beautiful. But Mr. Merchant, I'm sorry to say, spoke two, I, I don't know how many lies he spoke throughout this presentation, but I want to point out two. It is false to say that St. Paul allowed bishops to marry homosexuals when St. Paul denounced homosexuality. And it was Greece that was homosexual and not Rome. And it is not true that only homosexuals are holding aloft the banner of love. That's again a false statement. But I don't want to get into a fight with him right now. Okay, can I'm sorry, we, we, uh, I don't can, think, can I, I, I appreciate question, that, but please? I don't think we can take comments at this point. I don't okay. even know if we have time for any more questions. We don't, we don't. I'm really sorry about this. Check, but check. I will, I will uh, ask Barbara uh, for final thoughts on uh, what was asked can, before, before can, we conclude. Can I put my question before that, please? So uh, that I'm sorry, both can't, we can't yeah, take yeah, any more right questions. Right. This is really I, not up to me. I've been told that I cannot take more questions. Uh, the speakers are going to be around, so perhaps you can just have a word with them later on. Is that all right? I'm sorry about this, ma'am. This is not really up to me. Stay I'm very, I'll be very sorry if you leave this hall thinking that any of this was about perfection. Several of you have mentioned the perfect person. Of course there's no such thing as the perfect person. There's no such thing as the perfect life. That's storybook stuff. There is no such thing. So I hope that nothing we've said here has you going out thinking that you're going to, now your job is to find and create something perfect. You'll be miserable for the rest of your life. <laughs> True, but how we define perfection is also, and how we define our ideals is perhaps that, uh, how we choose our paths. But that's all we have time for. Thank you for listening.